Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2014-15 Bannon Institute on Ignatian Leadership. My name is Teresa ladrigan Wilkley, and I serve as the director of the Bannon Institutes and the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. What is the end for which you were created? What leads to God's deepening life in you? Drawing on the inspiration of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuits, this year's Bannon Institute explores the ways in which transformative leadership is rooted in one's own vocational integration. In the fall, we began our exploration of Ignatian leadership with a focus on leadership and justice, considering how commitments to solidarity and social justice ground the work of Ignatian leaders. In the winter quarter, we then focused on the role of faith in Ignatian leadership, reflecting on the foundational witness of Jesus and the catalyzing leadership of Pope Francis, as well as the import of interreligious dialogue and encounter in transforming and healing our world. Now, as we begin this spring quarter lecture series, we turn our attention to the role of the intellectual life within Ignatian leadership, considering the dynamic mission and means by which Jesuit Catholic universities, such as our own, seek to form whole persons, engaged citizens, and accountable leaders. To open up this quarter's lecture series, we are thrilled to welcome Father Jerry McKevitt of the Society of Jesus to reflect on unfinished business the past and future of Jesuit higher education. To introduce Father McKevitt, I would like to invite forward his friend and colleague and brother Jesuit, Father Mick McCarthy, Executive Director of Santa Clara's Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education, and my boss. Welcome, Mick. Two nights ago, I had dinner with an unlikely assortment of people, a professional lobbyist, a senior executive from a $50 billion company, a young man who will soon be graduating from Santa Clara University and this afternoon's lecturer. In the interest of full disclosure, this was a fundraising event and today's lecturer was there basically as a personal favor to me. <laughs> What I witnessed from our lecture at that dinner, though, was the exercise of a virtue I have seen in him many, many, many times before. Not only do I think it is one of his most salient virtues, but when all is said and done, I suspect it is among the things that are the most important to him. And that is this, the capacity to encourage. The capacity to encourage. Both the professional lobbyist and the uh, senior executive rather strikingly shared what they love and fear about their jobs and how they've grown in them. But it was the young man, let's call him Max, who felt special encouragement. Hired as a photographer to take pictures of the night's glitterati, Max was surprised to be invited to sit down and eat next to Father McKevitt. Surprised to be asked with genuine interest and concern, what awaits you after graduation? And when he shared that he and his friend are going to a part of the country they haven't been to before for reasons that they can't really explain, today's lecturer gently encouraged him, well, something is obviously drawing you there. It will be important to pay attention and slowly discover what that is. I describe this rather simple and small exchange for two not-so-small reasons. First, to show that the noble tradition of Jesuit education very often comes down to a real, live encounter between two human beings, one of whose whole purpose is to encourage the other. And encouragement often includes challenge. 
Father McEvitt has given his whole life not only to the study of this tradition, but to its practice. And second, the tradition cannot be taken for granted. As Father McEvitt will undoubtedly suggest, both in its past and in its future, Jesuit education faces real challenges. We speak with pride, for instance, of educating the whole person. But wholeness is a very mysterious concept. Basing an educational system on wholeness may be a challenge not only to a market economy, but to cultures leery of discourses that make substantive claims about wholeness. To discuss many of these issues of unfinished business, I'm pleased to introduce someone who has given me personally so much encouragement for so many years now. He's currently working on a book on Jesuit higher education in the United States, emeritus professor of history at Santa Clara University and university historian, author of many books, including A History of Santa Clara University, and most recently, Brokers of Culture, Italian Jesuits in the American West. Please welcome a very good friend and mentor, Father Jerry McEvitt. Thank you. Well, I've been described uh, as a historian. I'm not sure I like that. A friend of mine said a historian. You know what a historian is? Somebody who talks in other people's sleep. <laughs> so I'm a historian, but I'm also a preacher man. <laughs> so this podium this afternoon is also my pulpit. So hold on to your seats or your pews. Uh, I'd like to uh, start <clears throat> with a little personal story. Uh, a lot of my friends here, my Jesuit friends, know that I, I grew up in Quincy, California, a little town up in the Sierra, represented here by, by myself and a couple of students. Uh, but before that, I lived in a place called Lakeview, Oregon, depicted here. It's a town of less than 3,000 people. Uh, it's in, it's located in southeastern Oregon. Even Oregonians, I'll say Lakeview, they've never heard of it. Then they've certainly ever been there. Uh, it's lo called Lakeview because there's a lake out on the horizon called Le uh, Goose Lake. There's a migratory pattern of geese. Uh, so here's the little town in which I grew up, really from first grade through uh, first year high school. Um, it's, it's, it's the, called the tallest town in Oregon because it's, it's uh, over about 5,000 feet high. So that means really fierce winters, and it means very temperate, uh, lovely summers. So I, my heart and memory are filled with memories of this place, all fond of a place we used to play baseball out on the edge of town. that was a meadow, really, full of uh, purple lupin and yellow buttercups. Ideal. Uh, and I have a couple of memories I'll share with you. Uh, winters were a big season here. And one uh, winter, when I was about 10, my oldest sister and I, we'd had a big snowstorm, feet of uh, snow very high, so we went out with our friends and uh, rode sleds until it was getting late. It was like about 8 or 9 o'clock, and Mother had promised to make uh, cinnamon bread and hot chocolate for us when we came in, but we just couldn't go in. It was so beautiful. And so I remember I can close my eyes and walk down that street. Patty and I finally left, pulling our sleds, it was all dark, it was a street light, and it was lighting up the street, and these silver dollar snowflakes were coming down. And we were surrounded by complete silence. It was exquisite. Another experience of this country, a couple uh, years later, I was about 12, a buddy of mine told me one day in school on a Friday, he says, you know what, Jer? I've got some traps. And last Friday, I set them up in the hill above town. You want to go with me and see what I caught? Well, I wasn't. I was curious, put it that way. So off we went, and Alan had set his traps, went from place to place. It was, it was now late October. It's getting cold. Uh, and not a damned animal. There's no wreck. Nothing had been caught, much to my relief. Uh, at one point, we were heading home down this canyon. 
which is actually right down, it's on this little canyon here, going to our houses. He lived in one part of town, I in another. We said goodbye, and as we were walking down there, I couldn't wait to get home for dinner. It was getting cold, but I stopped for a moment, and I looked out across this valley. The sun had set, and it was all golden, with a little bit of dusting of snow, because the winter was coming on. Um, and uh, everything, with this golden hue, and, and then the purple of night was coming in, the dark blue, you know, that you have. And once again, I didn't want to go in. I wanted to stay there and soak up this moment. But my stomach got the better of me, and I trudged on home. But I remember that. I can stand in that canyon to this day. And a curious part of this thing about this little town is I have a hunger for the place. I'm always wanting to go back. And for many years, I did some work in Spokane, and I would commute up. And I'd always arrange the trip so that uh, I would stay overnight at a local motel in town. And then that afternoon, I'd walk around, and the next morning, I'd go back to our house, walk the street, these memories coming back. And then I'd go on about my business. And over the years, I have often arranged my travel so that I could pass through there again. And partly because I was trying to figure something out. What the heck is the pull of this place? Why do I have a hunger to return? At one point, I thought maybe something traumatic happened that I've been suppressing, you know. Uh, and why, why, why? What, are, what is the draw of this place? Well. Uh, life moved on. I, we moved to California. Uh, I went to college. I went to many universities, uh, most of them Jesuit, uh, all around the world. I took lots of theology and philosophy about the great questions of life, in addition to my history. You know, questions like, why am I? Why are we? What's our purpose? If God exists, what's that got to do with me? It was an education that was holistic and left no questions unexplored. Well, because of that education, I think, I eventually came to some resolution about the tug of this little town. Why did I keep coming back? Something dawned on me that drew me back to Lakeview. All my childhood recollections centered on a common experience, on a place that was in a way quite awesome. And I think of uh, Heschel, the Jewish spiritual writer who talks be aware of awe when you experience. That's God's opening to you. That's the beginning of religious experience, that sense of mystery and awe. So I finally concluded the commonality of all my experience was I was being pulled by beauty. The beauty of that meadow, the beauty of that walk with my sister at night, the beauty of that scene across the valley, just a glimmering, I mean, just not a big experience, but it was beauty. I was being pulled by beauty, and as I discovered, as a desire for beauty, more than I could even soak up or drink down. I was being drawn by beauty with a capital B. And I came to realize, this is how God often manifests God's self to us. It was the pull of transcendence. I was ultimately drawn to God, and it was through that little boy's experience of beauty that God drew him on. Now, it's taken me a long time to figure that out. Uh, but I, I think that's what, that was what was happening. So that story of the encounter with transcendence has taught me several things. One is that even children have religious experiences. We should never underestimate the capacity of God to speak to a child in very mysterious ways. Secondly, uh, the answers to life's big mysteries are not solved in solitary wandering. You know, kind of my own spiritual life, partly that but they're solved in community. So I am because we are. Study in institutions gave me the vocabulary, the concepts to draw meaning from my boyhood experience. And I have drunk deeply from that spring. I have a rich and happy life because of that. But I wonder if future students will have the opportunities I had to explore in this way. Well, this spring continue to flow, by here I mean this Jesuit educational experience I enjoy, or will it dry up? It could. What is the future of the Catholic intellectual tradition? It's kind of what I want to look at today. Now, my plan here this afternoon, uh, I want to explore first the role of religious formation in Jesuit education, kind of how it takes place. And part of my argument, I'm going to draw on my experience of Lakeview, my own experience, uh, that it draws upon curriculum, formal studies, philosophy, theology, history, whatever, 
That helps. Uh, but it also draws on an extracurriculum or activities like my whatever I experienced in Lake Bubling, hunting and fishing and all that stuff. Okay? You got me? So I got these two things I want to look at and how they played a role in Jesuit education down the years. Second, uh, I'm going to argue that this Catholic educational tradition is a case of unfinished business. Uh, it's still adapting. It still has some things to figure out. Finally, I want to conclude by looking at the crises facing Jesuit education today. First, a word about, well, why religion? So my topic is basically religion. Uh, it's been a part of American higher education from the beginning. We know Harvard and Yale, those were all founded as religious schools. As the historian John Thielen writes, religion also played a central role that often overlooked, even in 19th century American higher education. You know, Rockefeller's gift to found Chicago was driven by a desire to, to uh, create an eminent Baptist institution, Vanderbilt by Methodists, Duke, Catholic University by Catholics. So the contributions of religion to the United States religious life are significant. And I'm not going to labor this because I, you, you all know this. Both doubters and believers have benefited from the role that institutional Christianity has traditionally played in our national life. It's a communal role as a driver of assimilation for our parents and grandparents, and as guarantor of social peace in many parts of our history, and its prophetic role as curb against our national excesses and a constant reminder of our national ideals. The academic worth of theological study in Catholic higher ed has been summarized by the theologian John Courtney Murray, who believed that the goal of Catholic education is to bring students to intellectual and spiritual wholeness. So it's wholeness, that integrity, the thing Mick talked about, uh, and uh, both spiritual and intellectual. He says, revealed truth and rational truth are distinct. But if revealed truth is truth, and if the university is in pursuit of truth, on what grounds does the university decline the pursuit of revealed truth? Why should it refuse to involve its students in the great and highly intellectual debates that have historically revolved around the concept. So that's the core of really what this Jesuit education is about. But there's a challenge. There is a distrust, to say the least, of religion today. Meyer Schwartzstein, a filmmaker, has recently observed in the New York Times, while we're often very, we are a very open, we are often a very open in our society, American society, about a lot of things, but we have incredible discomfort about religion. A lot of the progress that we've made in civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, the media have been there first, covering it. But there is an innate hypersensitivity when it comes to covering religion, even embarrassment. Now, the role of this religion in Jesuit education, I think I'm going to kind of run through a quick survey of the first couple hundred centuries of this system of education to kind of provide a context for the religion, uh, talk about religion. So uh, the, the first universities were the, arose in the 13th century, the great medieval institutions. They're Catholic institutions uh, run by men and women of diverse uh, backgrounds. Uh, it has been said that their, uh, their objective was the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. And that's simplifying it. They provided employment for people to do, especially they emphasize theology, philosophy, medicine, and law. In the 16th century, a different type of university arose, uh, the humanistic, educationally reformed university. Uh, and this is, this is where the Jesuits order enters in, founded this time. And that's their uh, mother house or university called the Gregorian University or the Collegio Romano. If you've been to Rome, it's still there. It's an Italian state, uh, Scuola Media. And the, the goal of these institutions wasn't knowledge for its own sake. I mean, they wanted to provide uh, employment for the boys and men who came here. They were all one gender. But also, the, the goal was the improvement of society. And this was the goal of the Renaissance culture. So the Jesuits founded these institutions, over 800 around the world, and they were popular, extremely popular, because they satisfied what the need of society was. Now, uh, here's a, a classroom. So these guys, they're being trained for their own occupations, but also in a way that they will be useful to society. This reminds me of a class last spring. 
What's he doing? I could swear this guy is texting in the back row. <laughs> so now, in the medium for doing this, uh, so you've got this educational goal. You're going to educate people to get jobs and have good society. Uh, was uh, classical literature, pagan literature. So what they did, they drew upon these Catholic institutions, the great literature of Greece and Rome. And why? Because they looked at all the great questions of life. Every question, every question. Uh, so that was the, the, the instrument for learning. So and for classical learning, they also felt Cicero and the others had put, put great weight on the cultivation of virtue. The notion, Cicero said, we do not live for ourselves alone. And the Christian said, that's what we think, too. So they borrowed on this culture. And of course, the literature is in Latin and Greek. And Latin was the language you had to live, have to be a lawyer, to be anything in uh, Europe at this time. So the belief was that reading this good literature would produce virtue and public service in your alums. Uh, as part of this, a big part of it was the study of rhetoric, being able to speak and to communicate, uh, which you, know, you learn from Cicero and all the great speakers. Uh, and also, theater was hugely important because in theater you learn to project your voice. You didn't have this mic like I have. Can you hear me, Fran? Good. Uh, so, and how to how to control your body? Even ballet was taught in France. Why? Because the military wanted officers that could, could do what to do with their body. So the Jesuits were always accused of being very worldly. No religious order had done this sort of thing before. Teaching ballet, imagine. So, uh, so it's a secular. Uh, it seemed a very secular order. But one should not be deceived because behind all their secularity, the Jesuit operation is driven by religious concerns. Uh, but religion played, you know, like formal religious instruction was almost absent in these schools. If you put a slice of a pie, the, the religion piece was very small. And the reason was the whole culture of the place promoted religious values. So I use this graph. We're going to see this again. Also, because I also use this graph to say, I'm going to talk about a very small part of Jesuit education, not about the classics, not about chemistry, not about speech, not about theater, but religion. Okay? And it's, the system was certainly not just religion. Okay. Now, my focus this afternoon with you is the Jesuit education in the United States, as it's been since the end of colonial days up to the present, now personified by uh, many high schools and 20, these 28 universities, of which Santa Clara, of course, is one. Now, the first of these universities was uh, Georgetown, founded, we're not exactly sure what day, but the, at the end of the colonial period, after the American Revolution. Uh, and John Carroll, when he founded the school, he saw Georgetown, his college, he used the term, it will be the, the anchor, the sheet anchor of religion. Sheet anchor. Well, we don't have sheet anchors anymore. I don't even know if we sail. The sheet anchor was an anchor you had on board the deck, uh, on the deck of the boat in case you're out at sea and you lost your other one, got popped and you lost it, and you'd have one for emergency. So this was seen as an emergency thing. It would be good for the church. The place would, it was essential for the church to train clergy, although that didn't last very long, and to train Catholic laity who would take their position in society. But the primacy of religion here, now they're trained like at any other school of the day, you know, to get a job, but, but this is really essential. Um, uh, and it was uh, Noah Webster who wrote a lot about education in this period said one thing is one of the aims of education is to give the students a good education in manners, arts, and, statu and uh, sciences. That's important. But to give them a religious education is indispensable. Indispensable. So this would be common to both Catholics and others. In the 1880s, Boston College addressed the question, what is education? In its completest sense, it is the full and harmonious development of all those faculties that are distinctive of the human being. But this religious instruction testified to an appreciation of the role of religion in human life, obviously. But it also aimed at affirming confessional identity. 
That is, that Catholicism over other religions. And the way religion was presented, it reinforced religious differences. That's one of the things that happened here. Uh, and also, these colleges were more interested in moral training than intellectual formation. In most of these places, there were no courses in religion. It was not part of the curriculum. There, were, there was weekly instruction in catechism for kids according to their age, but no formal religious instruction. For the intellectual dimension of the religious experience, philosophy functioned as queen of the sciences. So it was in philosophy especially, uh, as at Protestant colleges, that there was a close integration of reason and revelation. Again, addressing all the great questions, God, the human soul, the purpose of life. Now, a shortcoming, so you would have seniors in most of this system would spend their whole final year studying philosophy, a whole year of philosophy, so that was significant. Religion, a little slice of the pie. Relig uh, philosophy was a big piece, giving, and the, 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 uh, yeah, to give uh, really intellectual structure to belief. The shortcoming of this system in the Jesuit schools was that a student's faith could be called into question if the student could not accept scholastic philosophy, which had its own terminology. So philosophy was supposed to provide a rational warrant for faith, but if you didn't buy the philosophical system, you were really up a creek. It could be a real crisis for a kid who I don't buy the philosophy, so what's the rational basis for belief? So it's sort of inviting to fideism if you couldn't buy the philosophy. Religious identity was imparted in other ways. One, here's this Fordham around 1846. All these schools, like our own Santa Clara, would have its dormitory, its hall for uh, instruction, and a chapel, always a chapel, and that's still there today at the Fordham campus. Um, so here's a shot, a view of, uh, I think, of, yeah, of Santa Clara, our chapel. That's gone now. That was a little building kind of where the Rose Garden is today and a brochure for a, a retreat. So the system was surprisingly simple and easily maintained. It was attained, it, religious instruction was provided through sort of the catechism, that was the, in the curricular part, but also a network of symbols that created a sacred same space-time canopy over the whole educational process. An annual retreat, constant contact with professors, most of whom would be Jesuits, all of whom were Catholic. Here are some Georgetown students in the 1870s. As student diaries from this era attest, their activities included a host of things that we might call religious, morning and night prayers. You know, the, the, with the quarter system here, we hardly have time to breathe a holiday. In this system, every time there was a saint's day, you had a holiday, a big holiday. Uh, in the 1850s, a student at Georgetown found himself drawn back to the community, the college chapel every Sunday to hear sermons from the president, a fellow named Bernard McGuire. He wrote in his diary, Father McGuire far surpasses anything I've ever heard. His arguments are most clear and convincing, and his language is most beautiful. It's curious to me now how often that word beautiful arises. They will, the student diary will talk about the beauty of the music, the beauty of this. And of course, they're being trained in rhetoric, and they would be keen on uh, knowing how to appreciate that. So religious instruction didn't rely on abundance of theological information. Instead, it was imparted in other ways. So if you look, this is a scale now. I'll do this for all these years to sum up how religion was imparted. So in this era, through most of the 19th century, uh, the left there indicates the curricular part, study of theology. It really wasn't theology. It was catechism. On the right are all these extracurriculars. Uh, yeah, all of these. You follow me? Yeah, all sorts of stuff. So in a way, it seems to me, it's not unlike, perhaps, Santa Clara today. Students are not getting much theology. You could get there with no theology. You could have a course doing religious studies, you know, possibly. But no formal uh, religious, really, instruction. But you have a lot of other stuff that we'll look at here that maybe serves the same function, we'll see, as it did in the 19th century. <laughs> Now, this system ran into trouble at the end of the 19th, 30th, 20th century. By 1900, a Jesuit at St. Louis University wrote, we are losing caste as ed ed educators, so we're losing our, our prominence, our status. 
we're not much respected anymore. So these schools like Santa Clara that have been mainstream in the mid-19th century, at the turn of the century, are in a backwater. The president of uh, Georgetown declared, we must be on the alert to adjust our colleges to the altered circumstances of the time. So the world, the world had changed. And it's summarized in, I love this cartoon. This is from, uh, yeah, Princeton, in the, the uh, Princeton School Magazine. Uh, so this is a student literary magazine. Princeton had just built a new chapel, and the students put out this cartoon. And the little girl is asking her mother, Mommy, is that thing a white elephant? What's that doing on the campus? And Mummy is paralyzed, her mouth agape. She doesn't know what to say. So the point is, this shows the, the role of, of religion on college campuses is shifting uh, very quickly. So religion, which once occupied a central place in America, is now in a precarious uh, position. Now this posed a challenge to the Jesuit colleges, which made religion a central part of a reason for their institutions. Uh, and what were the reasons why this was so upsetting or provokes a reaction to the Jesuit schools? Partly, uh, everybody now starts criticizing a classical curriculum, which the Jesuits hung on to to the bitter end. And also at this time, there's a new emphasis on graduate and professional schools. So you see one of these Loyola New Orleans and these uh, students. Uh, so students aren't the same as they were once more, uh, once before. Huh? There are different class of students, and many of them are older. Uh, also, one of the things these schools and Catholics had to contend with, which is always a constant there, is anti-Catholicism. Um, it's always there, and it always provokes some kind of reaction on the part of, of Catholics. In the 1920s and 30s, there was the Ku Klux Klan, and its favorite victims were, were uh, Jews, blacks, and Catholics. So just one example how it affected or, uh, uh, education. This is, in Oregon, in Oregon passed a school law in 1922 outlawing declaring Catholic schools unconstitutional. Now this was a crisis. So you see here the cartoon making fun of the Pope as a threat uh, with propaganda and holy water in the public school system. So uh, these Catholic schools had to, had to uh, react. Now, eventually, this was declared unconstitutional by the, by the uh, Supreme Court, but it caused not a little bit of anxiety uh, in the early 20th century. Here's a curious thing. Um, a, a student at Loyola Chicago sent me this last year. It's a clipping in Hebrew, obviously, about, it's an advertisement put out by the Loyola University of Chicago in a Jewish newspaper to attract students to the university, especially the law school, the pharmacy school. So these schools are trying to attract, uh, these schools always had uh, non-Catholic students here. Always, always. At Santa Clara, sometimes even half the student body wouldn't be Catholic. So here's this uh, appeal to Jews to come. Well, we think that's sort of like something you'd find on our own day. But this caused a problem for the Jesuit schools. At this time, they're trying to enter into the public mainstream, raise money for these graduate and professional schools. And a lot of them did this. A lot of the presidents were giving public talks and telling the public, we are non-sectarian. Now, that was not a good term because they, were, they are sectarian. They're Catholic. But they meant what they're trying to say is, we're open to everybody, our student body, everybody can come to our school. Well, some, Amer some of the American bishops got wind of this, wrote to Rome, and the pressure was on. And the Jesuit general began sending letters to the presidents of these schools saying, you're claiming you're not Catholic. What is this? So for all these reasons, both pressure from outside the church and even inside the church, these schools now start emphasizing, re -emphasizing their Catholic character. You still with me? Uh, and one way they do this is by making a curricular shift, making theology and philosophy required for every student. This affected me. I went to USF in the late 50s, early 60s, and any of you older alums would have had this. I, we took one, uh, two units in theology every semester, three units of philosophy every semester. So I graduated as a history major, 
a philosophy major and a theology minor. So lots and lots of this stuff. Now, that helped me figure out what happened to me in Lakeview, Oregon. It was, I was good. I went to a public school, so I soaked this stuff up, but a lot of my brother friends didn't. Anyway, uh, so, but the idea here is, too, uh, that Catholics now are moving into the mainstream. And they need to know something about their faith more than just catechism. So you find, you find now theology really enters the curriculum uh, in the 20th century. And one way it did it was through this book. It's called, by, by, Wil, by, by Wilmers, uh, it was published in Germany and quickly translated into the United States. This copy is from Santa Clara. I found two copies here. All across the U.S., the Jesuit schools use this as their textbook. It's not a catechism anymore. I mean, it's apologetic. But I, when I had this photographed, I, I gave that to a friend to photograph for me. And he says, I started reading that book. He says, that's really impressive. I mean, it was very thorough. And all four years, a college student would uh, study portions of Wilmer's. But the, th and the, the, the thinking was, Catholics now, we need an educated laity in the church. Not like the old days. You know, in, in the earlier period, you didn't have theology, partly because the clergy took care of religion. You know, women took care of the house, the domestic sphere. Men took care of business, and the clergy took care of uh, religion. So, but now that's not the case. So part of a theme running through all this story, I'm telling you, is the evolution of the role of laity in the Catholic Church. It's kind of a footnote here, but it's part of it. So now you have professors, like those women being medical technicians, doctors. People need to be educated because they said, in fact, they'll say about this book, uh, you know, we live in a Protestant country, and people, non-Catholic, ask questions about confession, the Mass, the Eucharist, all this stuff, and we better be ready to answer that now. So you get Wilmers and this formal, really formal theology. So that up to the middle of the 19th century, there is basically a balance between the curricular and the extracurricular. So before, uh, yeah, and there's still retreats and mass and all that stuff, but now that's a lot of philosophy and theology to be taken. So it's, it's a period, it's an unusual period. Will we ever see that again? I don't know. We certainly don't have that now but it was really characteristic of the system. This emphasis on Catholicity uh, produces another era that we call, something we call the Catholic Revival. This is a shot of St. Joseph's Shrine here. Do you know where I recognize this on campus? So on the Feast of St. Joseph up through the 60s, the student body, again, still all male, would march out. The student body president would give a little homily, and uh, it was a devotional thing. So, this is a kind of golden age for Catholicism in America. Uh, the population was growing, political influence, and there's a new emphasis now on Catholic exceptionalism. So this is a world that has rejected us, and they, they really stress uh, how different Catholics are. Um, so it's a broad movement that promotes the notion of a distinctive Catholic culture, superior to modern culture, and expressing itself in Thomistic philosophy, intense spirituality, and Catholic action. So Catholics, worried about secularism and, non, and opposition, reinforced their adherence to a narrowly Catholic educational focus. I mean, here I just grabbed two little examples from, here's for, uh, for First Friday's uh, adoration in the Mission Church, go to Benedictine. This was big enough, a whole poster was put up on campus. Again, Santa Clara wasn't all Catholic, <coughs> but this was an important, important non-curricular activity. On the left here, you have the Owl Magazine, which the antecedent, the, the, the students changed the name of that about 20 years ago to the Santa Clara Literary Magazine from the Owl. But if you look at the articles in there, they're all in there arguing how Americans are part of, Catholics are part of American culture. And the distinctive uh, features of Catholics, that St. Robert Bellarmine had a big, the, the founders of the Constitution, writers of the Constitution probably had read Bellarmine, you know, that Jesuit theologian, things like this, arguing for the importance of, of uh, Catholicism. Another piece of this was what we call Catholic action began in Europe, but it stressed the importance of uh, Catholics getting out and into society, 
and making their influence felt. So if there's no shrinking around or embarrassment about being a Catholic. One of their motto is be bold, be Catholic. Uh, and this was every university across the country uh, promoted Catholic action. This Catholic ethos prevailed at all of these institutions. So no fear or no embarrassment. <coughs> Apart even from the liturgy, religion and Catholicism pervaded Christian life. There would be prayers before class. At Holy Cross, even the priests kneeled down and the students stood up when they had their prayer at the beginning of class, you know, the kind of extracurricular thing. To many students at Xavier University, the university's Catholic and Jesuit identity was of extreme importance to them. Students believed they were receiving a superior education than that at a secular institution. For example, in, 19, in the mid-1950s, a survey was taken of Xavier University in Cincinnati, of the students or graduates were asked why they chose that university, and its Catholic tradition was one of the top responses. Now, I don't think we get that today if we get asked that about Santa Clara. Even though no, no questions were asked about the Catholic character, 52% of the students volunteered that they appreciated the moral and religious guidance that they had received and identified it as a major asset. Give you some idea of, of what this world was like. But this world uh, was about to change. Uh, in 1960, Fordham, you know, many of these schools like Santa Clara had their own passion play, and Fordham in New York had its. It was called Oh My People. Uh, and they performed it for many years, as Santa Clara did. In 1966, they were ready for a production, but the president summoned the Jesuit director of the play to his office and said, drop that play. The director was puzzled since it wasn't expensive and it earned lots of publicity for Fordham in the New York press, and I've read that stuff, it did. The president's explanation for dropping it was, quote, that's just the problem, the publicity. It looks too much like Catholic propaganda associated with the university. So what's happening in this one little incident is Fordham was trying to reposition itself in the public mind, moving from separatism to engagement with the world. I'm going to call it secularism. This is a classroom at Santa Clara. This is one of my favorite 20th century pictures, a classroom at Santa Clara about this time. You've got all the, the Catholic, the crucifix, the priests, and Catholic. Um, by early 1960s, there was a revolution in Catholic attitudes building up, too, <coughs> about their separatism. The head of the Jesuit Educational Association said in 53, scholastic philosophy has become a dead, formalized thing that too often becomes mere memory exercise. I can vouch to that. I did it. Um, also, he said, you know, uh, the intellectual world does no longer speak the language of the 13th century. It certainly doesn't speak to college students today. So now we need historical, critical methods that will speak to the modern mind. So there's a new emphasis on scripture, on Bible, and trying to get a lot of deadweight Jesuit philosophy and theology teachers out of the classroom. And the big push for this was Vatican II, of course. Which now, now Vatican II initiated a lot of things, but it also confirmed many things that were already underway, like these internal criticism of Catholic education. <coughs> so what you have happened now, you get my point. That's separatism. In 1966, the President Walsh of Boston College gave a new definition to the primacy, the primary role of Catholic education. He said, the primary goal of a university is intellectual formation involving a philosophical and theological sophistication in the total teaching purpose. But our business is to lead students to knowledge, not to directly turn them into apostles or saints. Now, he said, religion has a purpose here, but the Catholic university should be and must be in the future much more than it's been in the past, namely a pace, a place where the church does its thinking that phrase that we often hear. Uh, here's a cartoon of Santa Clara about 1989, showing a world totally upturned. Huh? So the big emphasis now is on student initiative, student self-government. Uh, it means often a lot of hell breaking loose. Uh, philosophy and theology requirements were reduced quickly, to 1962 to nine, and to four, and finally to two, making room. So philosophy and theology, which had been the core of the Catholic intellectual tradition. Now is now 
a drop down. Another shift was shifting from religious, uh, religious departments to departments of religious studies, or for departments of theology, departments of religious studies. Another part of this refer reform is symbolized by this uh, image, this moving image um, that Vatican II addressed in a profound way. So we were, the, the council said, you know, Catholics now have to take responsibility for the world. We have been ghettoized a lot, lived our separate way, but we have responsibility for solving the problems of the world. You know, the question was, who's responsible for this sort of heartbreak we see? And the answer was, we are. We are. And this has really changed uh, at, least, at least many of these Jesuit schools. Well, uh, yeah, a lot of them. Uh, so now there is this emphasis on the promotion of justice, the caring for the marginalized. And that will, that's going to shift the Catholic character of a school. Equally important, in 1971, the Synod of Catholic Bishops met in Rome, and they, they said many things, but one of the things they said was, furthering what Vatican II has said, the promotion of justice is a constitutive dimension of the gospel. Now, that's pretty strong. So don't call yourself Catholic if you don't care about this or doing something for it. Now, this was quite a trauma, of course, for many Catholics, uh, but that's, wh that's where we stand today. Uh, so you now have this faith-seeking uh, justice, a lot of these activities. So what has shifted now, I think, today, it's back to like the 19th century, where the Catholicism of the place is really personified, not so much maybe in courses about justice, maybe unfortunately, but certain justice activities. If, if you're around these schools at all, there are immersion experience, all sorts of things uh, that uh, shape students' human and religious life. And the formal theology or philosophy is practically zilch, none of that, which raises problems. This has raised a big difficulty. This is just a poster from Gonzaga University in Spokane, where a professor is bewildered. Is Gonzaga still a Jesuit Catholic university? And that was asked of Santa Clara, of all of these places, after the changes of Vatican. And it is still asked. It's still asked. Uh, and I want to f kind of wind up here with looking at what I call the crisis of Catholic education. <laughs> and it's not my term. A lot of books have been written about it, and they use the word crisis. It is in a crisis now. So that which I have described to you, many people now question, can it continue? Will it continue? We can talk about the crisis. I think that's a good term. But I prefer, when we do that, to talk, use the Chinese term, which I cannot pronounce. Paul Mariani can. But it, the Chinese term involves two symbols, one meaning danger and the other means opportunity. That's a very different thing, isn't it? So if you think of the crises in your life, just think back on them. Those are dangerous experiences. You wonder if you'll sink sometimes. But when you look back on them, you often find there was something hidden in there that I pulled out. I became a better person. Uh, dealing with dying people, I see that all the time with their terrible illness. They'll often say, even I've heard people say, you know, I wouldn't even give this cancer up now because this crisis has provided opportunities I could never have anticipated. And that's my argument about the crises facing this educational system. And it, it's, I'm just going to put a few of them. <coughs> One of them has to do with this notion here that religion is for idiots <laughs> or uh, children. So the danger is that now the United States is a nation in which religious faith has been steadily marginalized. There are many causes for this. Uh, the media is largely deophobic, and the, the academic community, American academics, are equally often, the academy is often deophobic. Um, for example, I give you an example. At Harvard a few years ago, they debated a curricular reform, uh, and they thought they would uh, set up a committee to have a course in religion. The recommendation, many faculty members complained, would entail an intrusion of superstition into serious study. So here you have it in the academic community at Harvard. So the religion requirement was dropped, and the whole thing became a cropper. Faculty were not accustomed to thinking about education in holistic terms. Um, and this uh, shift in attitude, I think, threatens a fundamental definition of Jesuit college as a place uh, where religion is a sheet anchor. The historian Paul Shore wrote re recently about 18th century Bohemia and the suppression of the Jesuits there in the 1700s. 
And he says, he kind of concludes why this happened. He said, it, the society was in its educational system was doomed because its underlying reason for being, the promotion of the values of Christianity, became less important to the most powerful elements of the society as the 18th century wore on. My concern is, is the same thing happening today, or will it happen? Many believe it is. Not the suppression of the Jesuits, uh, but is the educational system doomed because its underlying, underlying, underlying reason for being, the promotion of Christian values, has become less important for the most important elements of our society? I think that's a danger. Uh, on the other hand, I see it, this is a crisis with, filled with opportunity. It's precisely this tradition which presents the Jesuit University with a singular and unique and really a new opportunity. The, the writer Clifford Longley has argued that the demissal of, vir, uh, demissal of virtue from modern consciousness hasn't done us any good. Uh, he said, consider the pursuit of profit without regard for prudence justice, temperance, and fortitude, and merely offering a course in business ethics isn't going to enthrone virtue, though it certainly helps. So the moral formation of the young needs to encourage virtue, which may be done less in the classroom and more in the, more in the sports field or more in old folks' home. So he's saying, what we have to offer is of value. So that there is that threat, the anti-religious thrust of society today. Uh, let's see. I thought there was something. Yeah, I'm running through this. Uh... Another uh, danger I would see a crisis is pluralism, that American word that's so important to us today. We now live in a pluralistic world, contrast with the pre-Vatican II era. We're not all Catholics. We're not all Christian. Faculty, students, and staff come from a rich rainbow of diversity, religiously, ethnically, socially. This brings both challenge and opportunity. In earlier eras, people wondered, how could you have a Catholic university where only a third of your faculty are Catholic? I mean, how do they impart this thing? Which raises the question of mission. What, do you hire, do you, does a place have the courage to hire for its mission? Um, and as a university becomes more pluralistic or even ecumenical, there's the danger it's unique Catholic tradition will be adopted. Take ecumenism, for example, something that is very uh, dear to us today. Uh, our own Jim Bennett of the Religious Studies Department has written on this, and he reminds us in an essay in Explore, he says, perhaps our inclusive rush to identify similarities across denominations, combined with the ever-pressing need to engage non-Christian and non-Western traditions, lead us to neglect more subtle differences that if we looked at it might enrich ourselves in our environment. Let's not miss, well, well pursuing our similarities, let's not... Uh, uh, forget our differences. If we rush to make any spirituality too encompassing or too inclusive, we will lose sight of the specific contributions that each tradition makes and of the dynamic ways different traditions interact. You see his point? That it's so, it's always a via media here, juggling all these things. Uh, on the other hand, the valuing of variety is essential, obviously, pluralism, ecumenism for a Catholic university. Uh, and with faculty from a variety of traditions who are born to dialogue. John Hoy, a theologian, thinks, as argues that, uh, in a book called Where is Knowing Going, uh, that the Catholic intellectual, intellectual tradition has the ability to integrate and absorb variety better than other intellectual traditions. So he said this should be a strength of Catholic places, uh, partly because of our commitment to both faith and reason, whether well, other places would emphasize only the reason. A finally danger here, this may surprise you, I think is our faith and justice, our justice uh, contribution. You know, when this was introduced, some faculty, including at Santa Clara, said, oh, I thought we were a university, you know, not a soup kitchen. Well, I think we have absorbed that and see that that's not a problem. But others ask if the diminishment of theological instruction and the emphasis on social justice as leaving students with an inadequate understanding of Catholic intellectual tradition uh, there was really a dissertation done at Harvard about Holy Cross, and I was surprised to read there that many of the faculty agree that their undergraduate population's uh, Ill illiteracy regarding knowledge of the church is really disturbing. So they don't, they, they're, not, they're not getting this. A second concern is that knowledge of Catholic tradition has been reduced, perhaps, to social justice. Um, 
And many times, a university's rhetoric doesn't even hit at the theological underpinning of the commitment to justice work. After all, helping the poor is not uniquely Catholic. It's become social uh, justice is really a term of good citizenship for any university today. So the problem is finding a, a balance between extracurricular and curricular uh, training. Also, another question about the justice work, not only making sure, you know, it's one thing to believe social justice is important. It's another thing to believe that God expects, God expects this of you. It's a much more urgent question. So the extent that we divorce our institutional commitment to the faith, underlying faith commitment, I think we weaken it. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, opportunity, social justice offers an opportunity to engage in non-curricular religious formation. And that's the point I really want to make here, um, that there is an opportunity, that I think this, at least my, and this is really based more on my own experience with students here and other places who gave in, engage in uh, social, social action and work with the poor. People are changed by that. They are changed by that, and often changed religiously. It's very important. So a lot of the, a lot of the religious tradition, I think, of a Jesuit place can, if it's willing, uh, be carried by this justice of work. You follow me? Finally, okay, we're getting to the end here, folks. I begin by expressing the hope that what I experienced in Jesuit higher ed many, many decades ago might be available to other people. Achievement of this goal can be achieved, I believe, despite the certain challenges that are faced. <clears throat> so many of these obstacles have been faced in the past. I've tried to explain that. Huh? But the world, needs, the world needs what our system of education has to offer. There is crisis, but there is equal opportunity for us. If we have the courage and the leadership to supply that need, it is indeed a unique opportunity where we can provide leadership. And I want to close with a reflection on the thoughts of two previous Ignatian Center presenters. One is Marilyn Robinson. Remember, she was here a year ago. She's spoken about how fear prevents us from living courageously and fully. Uh, she says, I think this has become prominent in our culture, and fear is often an excuse for not doing something. Fear has, in this moment in history, a respectability that I've never seen in my life. She's a smart woman. We have become overwhelmingly fearful, and our fear has become a respectable excuse for not acting as we should. For example, there are prohibitions of an unarticulated kind that are culturally felt that prevent people from actually saying what they think. It shows especially in our inhibition to speak about faith or our ignorance of it. It's as if when you describe something good, you're being deceived or deceptive. It comes down to fear, the fear of making self-revelation, or about to say the seriousness of your conviction that, you know, I sense sacredness in things, saying it. There's a lot of writing about religion with a cold eye, but virtually none with a loving heart. Fear has come to keep us at bay from our best selves, the selves that could and should do something. Now, I think that's true of us individually. It's also true of institutionally, I think, at this stage of many Catholic Jesuit institutions here. Finally, Christopher Wyman. Remember him? He stood here about his poetry. Boy, that was quite an afternoon. Truth be told, Wyman says, you and I hunger for faith and the transcendent. It wasn't just that little boy up there in Oregon who was drawn to that beauty. We're all drawn to it. But fear and other obstacles impede us from attaining it. And the result, Wyman says, we go away starved. We are starved individually, and others whom we might have fed or let drink from the spring are starved too. And that's not right. So our educational tradition has the potential to feed that human hunger, to lead people to the spring, to slake their thirst. And I say, let us not be afraid to use it. Amen.
if you are still awake, if you've been provoked by now. Do you have any questions for me? An awful lot in a few. Yeah, Tom? Uh, let's see. Let's get the uh, mic so we can hear. <laughs> Thanks for your terrific talk. It's um, inspiring. Okay. A question about some practicalities that you think that if you had your way, uh, what are some specific things that Santa Clara and other Jesuit schools could, could do to move the ball forward around this fear issue? Are there some things, fantasies in your mind that would be um, uh, uh, on your wish list? Um, well, I'm not going to comment on Santa Clara. Uh, I'll comment in general on the system. I, I, I would say a problem for many of these places uh, may not so be much giving voice to their mission, a mission statement. The real killer is hiring for mission. And if you're a faculty member, you know exactly what that means. It is very, very difficult. Uh, I know we had a panel here, the center sponsored, was it last year, four presidents about being president of a Catholic Jesuit university. Nobody addressed that question. It came up, and they said either maybe I got an app words from one of them, or maybe they said, this is the crucial question, hiring for mission. But nobody volunteered any way to address that thing, because it's so thorny, you know. Um, you know, how do you how do you do that? And I, I think, but others have said, there's a fellow named Breen at Loyal Chicago, a lawyer who has written about, and he said, if that question isn't answered and resolved, that's the end of these Catholic Jesuit places. There is simply no way they're going to continue by bringing on anybody and everybody. You've got to have, and this is true of staff and faculty, uh, who care about it, who understand it, and who care about it, and are going to do it. Does that mean we're all alike? God save us if we're all Catholic. That wouldn't be, that's certainly not what we want. Uh, and we know, at a place, we know for Santa Clara, the rich, uh, richness that is provided to our mission by faculty who are not Catholic. But you, we need a core of people who are sympathetic, who understand the mission, and are dedicated to it, and are willing to stand up for it. That's the problem is the fear, I think. Now, it calls for clever, I think, very clever people how to do it. It's thorny, but it's got, it's just, it's a dilemma that I think has to be, has to be looked at. Whether you set up a, a group to do, I don't know, but there are other, but you, that's enough, right? You, oh, that's more than enough for a lifetime. <laughs> well, can I follow up on that? Yes. Now, let's get the uh, letter, let's hear you. Okay. Um, well, the bishops play a role in that fear on the part of the presidents. And they put a chill on hiring Catholic scholars because they'd rather hire a well-trained Protestant scholar who do, they don't have to worry about them. <laughs> yeah. um, so do, do you, as, can you point to another time when the bishops caused the problem or when the bishops helped solve the problem? Yeah, it is both. I, that's the trouble with every serious question. It's whole men, whole day, on the one hand, on the other. Well, the 1920s, the bishops caused a problem for these Jesuit schools that were trying to get on their feet, you know, academically. And then they say, what are you doing? You've got so many Jews in the pharmacy school at Fordham, or you've got so many this, so many that. Uh, I mean, the presidents had described what they're doing, perhaps in poor language, but it really put the, put the squeeze on them at a time. So they were asking, are you still Catholic? That very question that has been asked in our own day. Uh, there have been other cases, and we don't have a lot of time for this, but where, uh, where bishops or Rome, whatever, were very helpful to these schools. In the 1920s and 30s, football, there was what they called in Latin uh, the furor athleticus, an athletic fury. <laughs> these schools were consumed with athletics. Santa Clara had, I've forgotten now the figure, maybe a 25% of its students were on athletic scholarship playing football. So everybody was, uh, you know, this was a big thing. It's how they got status by doing this. One force who said, watch it, was Rome, which means the Jesuit order, you know, superiors in Rome said, this isn't good. You've got, this, you've got to really bring this under, you're an educational institution. 
And there are other examples like that. So it's, you know, in our day, we always think Rome is the problem. Rome is the, well, not always, actually. You know, but, yeah, uh, let her, let her. Uh. Thank you, Father. Uh, speaking of Rome, what is your opinion of uh, the Land of Lakes Conference influence on Jesuit education? 1967, I believe. Yeah. So what's the, what was the influence of the Land of Lakes? Oh, my goodness. Um, so that, uh, briefly, that was a conference uh, in the 19, about 97, 67 or so, where the universities got together, led partly by Notre Dame, and tried to, decided they wanted to separate from Roman control. Uh, and they wanted to, in response to the Vatican II, laicize the school. That did not mean they wanted to abandon their Catholic character, despite what you may have read in the San Jose Mercury last year. But by no means, separate incorporation meant uh, uh, was this, that the Jesuit community would separately in, legally incorporate itself as a legal entity, thereby giving the schools to the board of trustees to make it very clear Jesuits did not own the schools. And there were a lot of reasons why the order wanted to do that. So if you're asking, you may be asking, oh, what was the ultimate move of the Land of Lakes was to separately legally incorporate and have a board of a lay board, a Jesuit lay board of trustees for the school. Uh, I don't see how that could have been avoided. Uh, they, a lot of these schools were eager. They needed federal money. That connection wasn't always a help. Even Fordham, for a while, disclaimed it was a Jesuit university, a Catholic university anymore, to try to get access to uh, some federal funding. So could that have been? I don't think that's the cause of our troubles today. I don't think so. Um, and it certainly didn't mean these boards of trustees jettisoned their Catholic character. Boy, that was made very clear. Uh, now, other, there'd be others maybe who would disagree, but I don't think the Jesuits could have done anything else. They couldn't keep, they can't today keep running 28 institutions. It's simply, uh, well, they don't run them by themselves. They can't even be present at 28 of them. So in a way, it helped prepare for the day where there'd be fewer Jesuits. And the, this whole theme running through here really is the enhanced role of lay people in these schools in a way that we have never seen historically. Yeah. Uh, but that non-Catholic boards now, not only Jesuits, but almost all uh, Catholic institutions in the U.S. are that way now, right? The boards being non-Catholic. Well, they're not non-Catholic. No, the boards would include people of all religious backgrounds, usually a large number of alumni and Catholics who understand the tradition, uh, but uh, I don't know of any of them that are all non-Catholic. Yeah. Is that? Well, I, I can what do you mean? They are not all Catholic. Oh, by no means. No, and they couldn't be. I mean, that wouldn't be a good university in our world. No, we're, we live in a plural. This is our world. We have to figure out a way uh, to, to live there and make it take advantage of it. Yeah, Jim. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, Jim and then Jim. <laughs> oh, go, go, go do Jim Benme, you're close to him. I, I wonder maybe picking up on the ecumenical metaphor, stretching it, uh, the language of crisis that you've described and the historical background for that, we also hear a lot of language of crisis in higher education in general right now, from cost to uh, is it uh, what students need, vocational emphasis, and, and hitting the liberal arts especially hard. So I'm wondering if you might reflect on the relationship between the crisis you see and the particularity you've described and how that might intersect with broader conversations about crisis of higher education in the U.S. You mean the cost factor especially? Well, cost factor, uh, there's a vocational Although, emphasis, the decline of the importance of the liberal arts, is a college education worthwhile in the broadest sense, not just the, I mean, it seems like there, there's a crisis, we talk about crisis in higher education and, and colleges in, in lots of different ways, and you know, I'm curious how the particular air, particularity you've described might be interacting or intersecting with some of those other issues. Yeah, yeah, you get Jim's point here that, you know, I've talked about the crisis in the Catholic Jesuit tradition. Well, <clears throat> that's merely a slice of a larger pie, the crisis in higher education today. Uh, cost is part of it. How are we going to keep paying for this? You know, the public is increasingly frustrated or angry about uh, the cost of tuition in many schools. It's a problem for the Jesuit schools. Got to, they don't have public money, so they've got to raise their money. Uh, how high can tuitions go? Um, so cost is a big factor. And that is a, 
huge factor, I would say, for Catholic colleges in general, because many of these places don't have hardly any endowment. Uh, and when a crisis hits, a Katrina or something else, or a major earthquake, some of these places will not be able to make it. At least I've heard there was a Jesuit meeting last year where somebody said, that alone would take some of these places down. Um, what are other aspects of the, of the general crisis of higher ed? Um, yeah, the, fail, the decline of, uh, of liberal education. But, you know, liberal education has been dying for about 80 years, I think, or more, 100 years. You know what? It's still there. Uh, but it is a concern. You know Del Banco? That guy at Yale wrote a, a book about the decline of the liberal arts college in a defense of precisely uh, that, that tradition and how essential it is. And he's worried that it, it, that it will disappear. Uh, because the, the, sh the greatest theme in American higher education, whether sectarian or not, has been secularization. By that I mean a, a shift toward a more worldly education, more practical. Uh, and the Catholic schools have had harder time dealing with that than others. Um, and it certainly presents us with a challenge. Um, I can't think of anything else. Can you, Jim, of that how I mean, yeah. Yeah, Jim. Okay, yeah, Jim. I'll let you get the last one. Jerry, would you comment on um, the potential or the opportunity for interdisciplinary activity um, between theology and philosophy on the one hand and the other parts of the academic uh, islands that we have in the world? And is that an opportunity? And is it happening anywhere? <laughs> Oh, I could get rather cynical about that. You know, the, all the universities since about since the last 20 years talk about the value of interdisciplinary study. Um, and I think where that's, uh, for a while I straddled two, two departments, and I'll tell you it was pretty hard, because each assumes you're my slave. I own you 100%. The other says you're ours 100%. Well, it's really, t it's tough. Um, Theology and philosophy, I wouldn't touch that with the proverbial 10-foot pole. Maybe somebody, you're good. but I know in, in many departments, in my own department, we often talk about somebody from another department that would ask to teach a course that we would count. So we, there is no more conservative group in the world when it comes to their own bailiwick than us faculty. Often very liberal in general, but not when it comes to change in our way of doing things. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there, I, I think there is more going on interdisciplinary here at Santa Clara than I'm probably aware of. Um, certainly, I know, you know, I know like in history, we're trying to hire people that can do, we're interested in global history, and that means some interdisciplinary study that we wouldn't have had before. So that's, uh, yeah, but I'm not going to give you a satisfying answer, Jim, I think. Uh, and a part of it's driven by finances, you know, you lose, if they take me away to teach a theology course, well, who's going to pay for that? Uh, you know, that's not very satisfactory. Oh. Do you think part of the problem that the universities have been Yeah, that's what some people would argue. This homogenization of higher education in America has, do, has done that. On the other hand, I would say uh, <clears throat> no school is divorced from the world. It cannot be. So, and this is certainly true of Catholic places. So you've got a, here's you've got a Catholic place, imagine me, uh, and I'm trying to uh, maintain the Catholic tradition of education. Well, if I don't, if we don't do that well, Guess what? There's going to be no students knocking on the door to come in. So a, an institution has got constantly to be in dialogue with the culture and adapt the things that it serves the culture. 
uh, without losing its old soul in the process. Sometimes that's done well and sometimes not well. But when finances are such a problem, it's really, it's tough. So I, I wouldn't agree with you 100%. I'd say it's nuanced again. Please join me yeah, in thanking yeah. oh, sorry. Father McKevitt for sorry, all that he shared sorry, with sorry, us sorry. today. <laughs> oh. no. Thank you for all that you shared and inviting us to a deeper understanding of the, the history, the trajectory of Jesuit education, and also, I would dare say, encouraging us um, as we imagine its future together. So thank you very much for your contributions today. A couple announcements um, for the good of the group. There's books for sale outside, one um, in response to this last question, Brokers of Culture by Father McKevitt, and then also um, a coffee table book, a beautiful coffee table book that um, Jerry McKevitt and um, George Giacomini, who I think is here as well, um, uh, co-authored in um, Telling the Story of Santa Clara University. Um, there are evaluations at your, um, well, are there evaluations at your desks? If not, there you go. There are evaluations at your desks. So if you can um, share the, your response to today, it's really helpful for us, especially as we imagine this next generation of Bannon Institutes. But you'll also receive an email um, with that so you can respond electronically or here now. And then our next event in this quarter's Bannon Institute series will take place, place next Monday. April 20th at 4 o'clock in this room, and we'll be hosting Stephanie Russell from Marquette University for a lecture entitled Guideposts and Forecasts, Shared Governance and Collaborative Leadership in Jesuit Universities. So really helping us to imagine that next uh, chapter that um, Jerry encourages us um, towards. So for now, thank you all very much for being here, and help me thank Father McKevitt one more time.